Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to see you back with us this morning. Thank you to my fellow governors who are here joining us, and uh, I'm, I'm so excited for for what we have on the the agenda this morning. Now, uh, be before we uh, before I introduce Frank, I do want to make let each of you know. Um, in front of you, you have a copy of this magazine, um, Deseret Magazine, and uh, this is a a, a full uh, the, a full edition based on exactly what we're talking about today: the the state of disunion in our country. Um, th this is a, a gift to all of you. I hope you'll take it. There's some amazing articles by some of the best thinkers in the uh, in the country today. Um, I'm looking forward as well to the second part of this session with uh, with a good friend Mark Andreessen and uh, talking about uh, AI. Look, we uh, we had this idea that uh, the, the the internet was going to solve all of our problems and bring us all closer together, and uh, we saw how that turned out. So I'm sure everything's going to go fine with AI. But just in case, we're going to have some experts here to talk about us. But um, be before we do that, I uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we've We've been, we've been talking about this Disagree Better initiative, and uh, the, the polling trends show how important this is. And uh, the, one, that Americans are more partisan than ever, and two, that this, the two sides distrust each other more than ever. And that lack of trust is, is incredibly dangerous. Um, yet, yet, as I mentioned yesterday, the data also shows something important, and that is this, that, that is hopeful, this, uh, this perception gap that exists between Republicans and Democrats. We're n really not as far apart as, as we think we are. Um, and understanding public opinion trends and what's behind them is critical to solving this polarization crisis before it spirals into a catastrophe. And uh, we have just the right person here today to, uh, to talk to us uh, about that. So uh, you all know who he is, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Dr. Frank Luntz is a pollster and commentator known to everyone in politics, but particularly for the use of his instant response focus group technique, which has been covered widely, including on 60 Minutes, Good Morning America, and The Front Lines. Now, he is, he's, he's, he's done surveys, more than 2,500 surveys, focus groups, ad tests, and dial sessions for more than two dozen countries and six continents, Fortune 500 company C and for many of you. Um, but, but here's the thing I'm most interested in, Frank. And by the way, he brought these amazing cadets with him today. Uh, they're the very best of the best. We're proud to have you with us. Thank you for joining us this morning, you guys. So. Frank and I don't know each other well. We've we've been in the same rooms and, and to some meetings together. But but uh, exactly two months ago, he called me after seeing uh, Jared Polis and I, Governor Polis and I, on uh, on Face the Nation, and told me that he he didn't know about our Disagree Better initiative, but that he believed it was one of the most important things happening in America right now. And he volunteered his own time, his own money, uh, to do uh, to do one of his language surveys to help us understand how to better talk about depolarization and. So Civility. So we, we are so excited to hear from Frank. We're going to finish um, this portion uh, in, in about a half hour, and, uh, and then we'll move on to the second one. But ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Frank Luntz. I'm glad you took down that photograph. I weighed 171 pounds on that day. I weigh 215 now. So what a great way to start reminding me that I've gotten fat. <laughs> uh, Governor Polis, Governor Cox, I'm so grateful to be here. I realize that it's kind of rare for me to be in this space right now. Uh, and I do also, not only governors, I want to recognize you, I want to recognize President Youngkin sitting right there. I thought that would get a better laugh, so. <laughs> So, so now, now I've, I've acknowledged I'm fat and I told a bad joke. What a great way to get this whole thing going. I've never had a more important presentation in my life and I am scared and I'm shaking right now because I've had some of the most awesome clients in my 35 years of doing this. I've been able to present to House members, to senators, even to presidents of the United States. Nothing is as important as what I do now. My client is democracy. And if you haven't realized what's going on out there, democracy is failing. We have forgotten how to talk to each other. We've forgotten how to listen to each other. We've forgotten how to, how to love each other. And I watch this as a pollster and it just gives me a big, fat headache. Because we're so angry and we accuse each other. And there's one other gentleman I want to acknowledge before I go through the, the data, and that's um, uh, Tim Shriver. Wonderful family, amazing service to the country. But Tim has dedicated his life first to Special Olympics 
And now to this special thing that we call the United States of America. And Tim, I would not be here if you would not help me out. So, Tim Schreiber. <laughs> this is not a presentation. This is a conversation, so don't wait for me. And by the way, uh, Governor Scott, you're going to see yourself. I have to warn you. You're going to see yourself on screen. Of all the people who've delivered messages on this effort, and there's been 16, 17 governors, and we tested them all, no message did better than yours. And you'll see it in a few minutes. And I want to encourage, I know this is really horrible. Then not only do I have, I have my back to the chairman, which is my better side, sir. <laughs> and he only came in third. We're but that's why you can trust it, because most people would say the person in charge was the best speaker, the best communicator. He's actually third best. But here's the good news for you. You beat your wife by one position. I don't think that is good news for me, Frank. <laughs> well, you'll have to work that out on your way back to Utah. So the language and respect, and I want you to see this because even in putting together this presentation, it was so hard because I was getting so agitated, so angry as I was reading the data. As bad as it is for people in this room, the worst generation, the generation most likely to be angry, to be dismissive, to cancel people is not your generation. It's your kids. And that's the problem. And that's why I'm so glad to have the West Point cadets here, why it's so important, because I can tell you there is one university where there is no cancel culture. There's one university that still treats each other with respect. There is one university that believes in courage, character, sacrifice, and service. And that's the cadets from West Point over here. So, Governor, I've got good news for you. I've never gotten an email from a focus group participant in my life other than to yell at me. This was very special. The more that they learned about this initiative, the more positive they got, the more hopeful they got. We have a higher degree of people who believe that this country is headed in the wrong direction than ever before. We have a higher degree of people who believe that this is the most disunified that we have been ever before. And most importantly, since you all believe in the American dream, we have more parents who believe their kids are going to have a worse life than they did than ever before. And so much of that is tied to politics. Now, here's the good news. The more local you get to them, the closer the government gets, the more faith they have. And in fact, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican, Independent, or Democrat. This place that you're meeting in right now has failed them. But you haven't. And the, my favorite slide, and take a picture of this, governors come in first. In your ability to relate to people, they have more faith, trust, and confidence in governors than any other position. It's close, but you're number one. And this is what's really cool about it. Republicans, as you'll see, choose governors more than anyone else. Democrats choose their president. But when you then ask them the favorability, Democrats are most favorable. It's working. You are working. You are succeeding overall in a way that Congress is not and other forms of government is not. So it's very impressive. And as you can see, the older that you get, the more favorable you are. So this is the good news. Now, most of it is bad from here. So if you scare easy, I suggest that this is the part where you escape, because from this point on, it is really bad. Three out of four Americans say they're mad as hell. I've been tracking this since 1992. This is the line from the movie um, Network. Network. Thank you very much. Don't do that again. <laughs> Back in 1992, I'm not, not going to be heckled by a lobbyist. <laughs> the only profession that has lower credibility in America is a pollster. <laughs> and that's because we do the polls. Mad as hell means you can't negotiate. Mad as hell means you're not listening. Mad as hell is about speaking. 
And when 72% are mad as hell, we have a problem. And by the way, I encourage you, if you got a question or comment, jump in as I go through this. It gets even worse. This is the polling data that I care most about because this is a nightmare. You ask people, are you invested in your country? And two thirds say yes, which is not a great number. But then you ask them, do you think your country is invested in you? And only a third say yes? Can you think about the consequences of that? When they think that their country doesn't care about them, doesn't believe in them, doesn't try to lift them up? This is not about government benefits. This is not about um, welfare or, or, or education. It's a belief that their government, that their country doesn't care. And when I saw these numbers, I had to stop. I got up and started walking around because all I can think of is, oh my God, it really is this bad. I don't want any governor to forget this number. I hope you take photographs of it. Because if your state, if your people believe that only a third are invested in them, that's not a crisis. That's actual failure. So you can see some numbers. 70% believe our democracy is under threat. Almost two thirds believe that there's more that divides us than unites us. And half believe there could be violence in 2024. If I could get on my knees and I knew I could get back up again, <laughs> I would actually do it to say to you how important this is. I've done 2,000 surveys in my life. I've done over 1,000 focus groups. You've probably seen them on TV. I've never been more frightened in my life. And I'm trying to figure out how to present it to show my respect for you and to basically beg you that you're the answer. We know what the problem is, and you're the answer. Let me show you how worse, how, how much worse it's actually gotten. Half of Americans won't state their point of view because they're afraid of being punished. Not just looked down upon, but actually punished. And more than a third have had this happen multiple times. Look at below that number. Two thirds of young people have stopped using their freedom of speech. That's a failure. Do you realize how awful our universities are right now? I'm looking around and the governor, I know what's going on in uh, Pennsylvania, at the University of Pennsylvania, up at Harvard, at Stanford. Schools all across the country, the kids are afraid. And it seems like nothing's happening. It seems like no one is protecting them. And this is the number that shows you how bad it's gotten. But it's not just there. One third have cut somebody off. I'm going to ask you guys, you know there's no cameras back there. I'm going to ask you, how many of you, be honest with me now, how many of you have stopped talking to someone because you found their politics offensive? Raise your hands. I appreciate the honesty. Look at that number. It's awful. And it's happening in our own families. 43% of the public stop talking to a parent, a mother, a child. I don't want to use bad language because you're from Utah. <laughs> I need help. Can a governor tell me what's a better phrase for a shit show that won't turn him off? Frank, we call those farm words. They're OK. OK, I do the jokes here. So let's get to the numbers about divided. 83%. As a country, are more divided than at any time in my lifetime. If you can see the numbers below on age, among those 65 and older who remember the cities burning in the 1960s, remember the protests on Vietnam, 92% of people over age 65 say it's more divided than ever before. If this is an evidence that we have to resolve this, I don't know what is. So I want to start to do language with you, and I welcome you to take photographs if you want to. The two words that matter most, divided and toxic. And I want you to note that partisan is almost at the bottom. This is no longer about politics. This is now about life itself. 
I disagree with how you live. I disagree with how you look. I disagree with what you say. I disagree with everything, but it's not just disagree. I hate you for being different. That's what this is. It's not Republican Democrat. It's not re liberal conservative. It's who we are as people. And by the way, the most powerful word of all is that we are dehumanizing people. I know you've had this fight in, in Colorado. You've probably had it in most states. So here's my phrase for you. And in fact, I hope the governors who've not participated in this will deliver a message. We'll give this a try. Our country is at a crossroads. They see this intersection right now. We have to do something or things get worse. Too much distance between friends, neighbors, coworkers, and even family, because it's all of us around us. Reject the status quo. We must begin by listening. And I was shocked at how powerful listening has become. But it's not listening. It's understanding. And I asked the people sitting in the back over there who have interests in putting pressure on the people in the front of this room. Understanding is what Americans are seeking. They will not yell if they think you understand them. So we asked them the question about this initiative. 8% are hostile, 65% are supportive. You can't get 65% for any initiative anymore, and only 8% are negative. By the way, look at the parties. Among Democrats, only 3% have a negative reaction. Among Republicans, 12%. And now I'm about to get myself done in. So I'll talk to the Republicans over here, because you're going to hate me, and you're going to hate me, and you're going to hate me. Oh, God. Um, this is not a bipartisan problem. There are plenty of people on the left who yell and are disrespectful. But the people who oppose this, the people who seek to stand up and shout, come more from the right than from the left. The people who are so disruptive and hostile are more likely to be Republican than they are Democrat. I, I don't know how to handle this because I don't want to shoot myself, but I can't stay quiet anymore. And I ask the Republicans in this room to search your souls and to recognize that the level of toxicity of the language within too many in the GOP has gone overboard. And some of you know this from your legislatures. Some of you know this from your activists. This is not giving Democrats a pass. It's begging the Republicans to stand up and speak out and say enough is enough. Please. And what's the biggest problem? It's not the soft stuff. It's about results. They believe that things aren't getting done. And I will say to you that it's the number one priority for your voters, a meaningful, measurable track record of success and results. That's the phrase that they're looking for. I know a few of you are seeking re-election right now. That's the phrase that they want from you more than anything else, a meaningful, measurable track record of success. And the problem is, they don't see it when this anger causes stuff not to happen. And the best example of that is the immigration legislation right here in Washington. The public has said, fix the border. Three months ago, we had an agreement. And now we don't because of politics. That's what the public hates so much. So let's do language. I'll stop by these. Any governor got any question? Am I dead to you? I keep waiting for someone to step up behind me and just pop me. You guys got to save me over here. It's why you're sitting in the second row. So here's the language behind it. Here's your phrase. Everything in this works. I'm not going to take you through all of it. Imagine is the most powerful word in the English language. If you ask, ask people to imagine democracy at its best, they would support this initiative five to one, six to one. 
a united United States is going to be taken by three or four of you who realize what a powerful statement that is. To reunite the United States of America is exactly what your constituents are looking for. You'll see that in a moment. It's not just about listening, it's listening with an open mind. That phrase really does matter. The fact that you haven't made up your minds, the fact that you're listening. I want to understand when you use that language. I want to understand. Explain it. It gives you the right to oppose. It gives you the right to disagree. The fact that you're trying to understand allows you to say, no, we have a different point of view. That's how you disagree better. A couple more from up here. It's fact-based, not evidence-based. How many of you in this room are lawyers? Raise your hands. If you're a lawyer, raise your hands. Get the hell out. <laughs> it's, by the way, the guy who laughs the loudest is the biggest lawyer of the room. It is, it is you, 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 uh, you protest. Um, there's evidence for the prosecution. There's evidence for the defense. We argue over evidence, but we don't argue over fact. When you take a fact-based approach to anything, the public is much more likely to trust you and follow you. And if, it's, if there's any other phrase, it does not work nearly as well. And that last phrase, healthy, honest, respectful conversations and discussions, that is the sentence, Governor, of everything else that should lead the website. Healthy, because we all believe that we need a healthy environment, we need a healthy schools, healthy families. Honest, because we're tired of people lying to us. Respectful, because that's the highest value. Conversations and discussions, that's the best phrase possible for this. In terms of, I want you to stop saying some things. It's not about empathy. It's not about empathy, and it's not even about listening. It is about understanding. It's not about consensus. It is about common ground. And partisan and polarized doesn't actually matter to people. Divided and toxic does. One other set. Cooperation and compromise is good, but listening with an open mind allows you to disagree better. I'm urging you, because I've been through your websites as I put together this survey. Take a look at what works and take a look at what doesn't. A couple more of these. Look at that dehumanizing. That's your challenge. That's actually what this is all about in the end, is we can't dehumanize each other anymore. You talk about the dignity index, brilliant. Tim, that whole process of getting people to think about how they communicate, it's not only brilliant, it's absolutely necessary in getting a better discourse. But the reason why is that we have to stop dehumanizing each other. Another example, I told you about United, United States of America. Everything I'm telling you here has been polled, it's been tested. I'm about to show you the focus groups in one minute. This is not my point of view. This is what the public says. And this is your phrase, your 30-second. For those of you who think this is important to be able to reach across the aisle, to be able to talk to Democrats and Republicans at the same time, this is how to do it. These words work no matter how left you are, no matter how right you are, young, old, New England, California, doesn't matter. Ways to work together side by side is visual in your communication. The other thing is that they're looking for perspectives and points of views rather than values or opinions or beliefs. A perspective and a point of view is what the public wants to know from you. And I think this one's really important. It isn't about civility. And it's not even about kindness. It's about respect and open-mindedness. So let me go to the... I'm going to show you a couple of ads. Uh, Governor Scott, this one you're going to recognize. The blue line are Democrats, the red line are Republicans, the yellow line are Independents. The higher the lines climb, the more favorable the response. We took all of the, your messages, there were 16 of them, and these are the ones that did best, and I'll show you why. When you face a disagreement, you can bring your points up. The but higher that really it climbs, be listening the better what, it what is. What are their points? What, what are their fears? Why, why do they feel the way they do? And, uh, and I think there's a way uh, to get through that. Uh, maybe learn something yourself. 
Maybe they will learn from you if you're calm and, and give a, a good argument instead of an emotional argument. If you still uh, get to a point where you can't agree, that's okay. It's okay not to agree on every issue. It's, it's okay not to win every issue. And, uh, and hopefully uh, you have that respect, mutual respect, so you can have those conversations. It's never too late to be a better person. It's never too late to be kind. Stephen, why was that message so powerful to you? Off the charts. The term disagree better resonated with me because it is something that is so missing today. Because most people seem to want to stay in a perpetual state of outrage, as if they enjoy being there. Always angry, always looking for a reason to cancel or argue with somebody. And that message in that ad shows that it's okay to listen. It's okay to say, hey, we can agree to disagree. We can still go have a, have a drink. We can still be state. friends. You know, I, I think about He's from your state. back when Ronald Reagan was president and the speaker was Tip O'Neill. They got along and things got done. That doesn't happen anymore. Keaton, why was that message off the charts for you? Empathy. I think our country could use with a big dose of empathy. And um, that's basically what he was describing, um, was just having more compassion for other people's points of views. I don't understand why we can't disagree. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing with your neighbor. My neighbors, my next door neighbors are the most wonderful people and have the exact opposite viewpoints of me. And so rather than empathy, it's understanding. And I wanna give you a challenge. I can elect any one of you. I can reelect any one of you and you can give a no negative pledge and I know how to do it. And I know that there's no way you're gonna say yes because you're all used to negative ads by consultants who tell you you have to tear down your opponent. You don't have to anymore. There is a path. And let me show you another example. Nothing great really comes out of negativity. So you gotta take a breath, take a pause, kinda have the responsibility of ourselves to be better listeners. And just say, okay, I'm not here to necessarily agree with this other person, but let's respect each other as individuals and make sure we understand they have a point of view and a voice. Who knows what their background is? Who knows why they have that, that opinion? Let's hear it. Daniel, please go ahead. I just think that part of being a great leader and a great communicator, one of the most important things is being a great listener. And I think everybody's so busy yelling their point of view that nobody's listening to what everybody has to say. And I think that's one of the things that's trying to bring it together is, you know, the foundation of this nation was raised on disagreement and there's nothing wrong with disagreeing, but we have to come to some kind of an agreement where we can both get something that we want. Shannon, why was that so powerful to you? It now listen so to this. To me because I had to have a surgery to have a tumor removed from my neck. And I lost my voice for, for a couple of months. And when that happens, you are forced to listen. And I've, I've tried to talk to other people about you can't, you can't be listening if you're already forming an argument or replying to someone before they finish speaking. It's your state. It's a respect, the matter of respect, I think he said. That's beautiful. And we appreciate your participation. And I particularly appreciate the, the sacrifice you're making to be here. I've never had someone struggle in a focus group. He was really hurting. And I kept offering, I said, I'll pay you, I'll pay you double. He didn't want to go. He wanted to sit and give his point of view because it mattered to him that much that he struggled in how he spoke. I've never had these responses before. When I said to you, this is more important to me than any other presentation, it's because they told me this is more important than anything they'd ever done. And they didn't care whether they were Republican or Democrat. In fact, the next person who speaks, that was why they liked him so much. They couldn't tell whether he was a Republican or a Democrat, and they appreciated that. Hi, I'm Spencer Cox, governor of Utah and chairman of the National Governors Association. You and I probably disagree on a few things, and that's okay. It's actually good for us but it's way too easy to let our differences become toxic. Our country is deeply divided, and most Americans are tired of the division. Disagreeing better, not disagreeing less, is the answer. 
When we engage in healthy, honest dialogue, we avoid demonizing others, and we're more likely to find solutions. Ryan, uh, why was the Spencer Cox ad so favorable to you? Um, it was favorable because I felt like it was very engaging, uh, almost like he had a, a resting smile, he had a sense of optimism, and uh, I didn't know who he was. So for me, he was a blank slate. He could have been a Republican, a Democrat, an independent. I didn't mm. know, and I liked the fact that I didn't know what his party affiliation was. Brooke, why was it so positive for you? I just feel like, particularly, like, I'm from Nashville, and, uh, like, it's kind of a blue city in a state of red, and then everyone used to get along very well at Function, and now, like, it's, like, city versus state. It's gotten so, people can't even talk. And so, to be able to discuss, like, things that are important to our city, not just the country, and not be able to talk, I think is, I would like to see more of that. That's from your state, Governor. What's great about this focus group is that so many of you, they represent your voters, your constituents. One more video to show you. I wish your wife was here to see this, because she came up with an amazing line that is really powerful. We have to make a change. Uh, we can't continue down this path. Uh, we don't want to leave a, a hopeless and, and, and a sad and divided world for, for our children. And I think uh, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to work together to solve the, these, these divides and solve these problems, uh, coming together to make that happen because we owe it to the next generation to leave this place better than we found it. To leave this place better than we found it was one of the most powerful statements of everything that you looked at in terms of your reaction. Can I get a few of you to explain why that phrase matters so much to you, anybody? Yeah, I, I feel like her overall message reminds us of our own humanity, that we're human, that our humanity. at the end of the day, any politician's goal is to improve our lives as humans. Mm -hmm. We focus on that central message, regardless of the approach that we take, whether we're Republican or Democrat, independent, at the end of the day, the goal is to make lives better for humans. And that's what she kind of underscored. Okay. I don't know if this will have any impact. I'm hoping you have a couple questions. I got five minutes to answer them. I'm hoping that I got through. I don't know if, if my delivery helped or hurt but I know how important this is, and I'm hoping that you take it so seriously, because I had people in my focus groups who were crying as we went through this process, and I've never had that happen before. I've had yelling and screaming, but it's beyond that. It's now tears for a country that they feel like they've lost, and they feel like they've lost it for their own children and for the next generation, and that will cause a parent to cry. Can I answer anything for the governors? Okay, I think I have failed. Anything from anybody? Governor. No, and first of all, I want to welcome from my home state our cadets at West Point. Really proud of the leadership that you're showing already at a young age. And Frank, this was inspiring. I would live, love to live in a world where we don't have to worry about the negative ads that are misrepresenting our, our character, our, our votes, our positions, our values. How do you run positive to counter that when people are more likely to believe the negative about politicians. You know, do you ever envision a world where uh, we can be all be victorious without what has become so ingrained in our democracy, which is pointing out the flaws of our opponents in a very negative way? Three ways. First is that word imagine, and I don't know if I can go backwards, but and I'll supply the complete PowerPoint. This is only a selection of, of the information. Is that word imagine? to ask people in your case, New York. Ask people, imagine a state, a system, at perfection. What could we be? What could we achieve? What can we accomplish when we are all working together, side by side, rolling up our sleeves to get it done? They actually see it. If you ask them to imagine it, they will want it. That's step number one. Step number two is, can't we do better than this? But it's for the incumbent to actually say, rather than tearing each other down, Rather than tearing each other apart, there is a better approach. Americans don't want more. Don't get, 
confused by all the advertising that you see and the commercials and all of that. We don't want more, that's quantity. We want better, that's quality. And if you're promoting a better approach, a better decision-making process, that takes you two-thirds of the way there. But then the third part, which is what we don't do, is we never say, I understand. We never say, I get it. So I know you've got Republicans in your state that give you a hard time. Instead of dismissing them, this disagree better requires you to say, I understand. I don't agree, but I understand. Now let's see where we can go from here. It is, and it's not empathy, and it's not compassion, and it's not kindness. When you recognize them that way, they may not treat you any better, and they probably won't. I know New York. <laughs> I, it's like every day, every time I go to New York, I get mugged. Just, just intellectually, I get mugged by New Yorkers. <laughs> Who here's from New York? Art. I'm gonna kick your ass. <laughs> like that. Completely uncalled for. <laughs> But everyone listening to the conversation will listen to you and will reject your critics. I'm not trying to win over my opponents. I'm trying to win over the people who make the decision who represent us. And that's why I say to you, it actually is possible to disagree emotionally and passionately and win the argument. It requires those three steps. Anything else I can answer? Frank, can I? Ask? Yes. Oh. No, I'm just curious. Uh, does that general discontent, if not pessimism, result in um, higher or lower voter participation? It's just to get your feel for that. And then another comment is: uh, Is that mostly anti-incumbent as opposed to um, just general? this, you know, general, general repudiation of the whole political process. I mean, how do you see that it has, working? It has increased turnout because people think that their entire lives are at stake. Young people vote because they, they're voting on the issues of abortion and guns. Older people vote because they're voting on the issue of character and uh, work ethic. Everyone participates, but they participate in such a negative way that to me, turnout is not the judge of whether this is working. It's the public reaction to what's being done. 80% hate Congress. A majority of Americans dislike both our presidential candidates. 70% don't want either of them. And yet that's what they think they're getting. The, op the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. And my fear is that people actually say, to hell with it all. I don't care anymore. And my greatest fear of all is that they convince their kids to feel the same way. When young people stop participating, that's when you know you've lost your democracy. And your second question was? It was basically whether this is, but you kind of answered it right now. It's whether this is against incumbents. And it's, against, kind of, it's against the... It's the whole across, system. Across this, yeah. It's the lobbyists. It's the special interest groups. It's the media. It's, it's all of it. We're supposed to be the greatest country in the face of the earth, and I know that many of you believe that. The problem is there are an increasing number of, Amer of Americans who don't, and I am concerned. And by the way, I know Mark Andreessen's coming in momentarily. The greatest threat is AI. The greatest threat, why not blow everything up, is social media. Are you going to kill me? AI's time has come. I, <laughs> yes, I, I look forward to him running this place because it's funny as hell. But you're supposed to protect me. Everyone, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.